All right, we'll do a, a brief introduction in a moment. As I mentioned in the email, it's, we're gonna take a, a moment of silence at the beginning of the class uh, for in honor of Re Remembrance Day, the uh, 11th day of the 11th month, the 11th hour, the end of World War I. Um, I know it's observed a little bit differently, I think in the United States than in Canada, um, I think. It's Veterans Day in Canada, in the United States, Remembrance Day. So uh, while all of us who enjoy the freedom of the Western world and democracies only enjoy it because of those who, who, who sacrificed in our behalf. Of course, those who live in Israel know that uh, even more, I guess, unfortunately, their Memorial Day, of course, is on mm -hmm. Holiday ER, which is right. itself quite it's amazing. Right. Rav Soloveitchik <laughs> points out, you know, the, the state of Israel as great as uh, one of the momentous events of the last, you know, 2,000 years, but the state of Israel cannot happen without the sacrifices. So really, like, I think the only country in the world that is, is crazy enough to sort of switch from the Memorial Day to Yom Atzmaut overnight here. Of course, we do it much, much differently. So uh, we do want to acknowledge, of course, and pay tribute to all those who, who fell in battle. And uh, we remember beginning from World War II, World War I, World War II, all the wars in the middle, and unfortunately the wars that are going on. So Alaska, I'm going to stand. I'm going to take it's now exactly 11 o'clock. If we could just take a moment of silence to reflect on that, and then we'll begin the class. Okay, Dr. Lakshan, Vakasha. Thank you. Um, you know, when, uh, when Rabbi Kelman made this uh, suggestion that we begin the session today with uh, uh, remembering Remembrance Day, I just, uh, first of all, I thought it was a, a, a wonderful idea. And second of all, I just thought about, sadly, we all know that at the center of both World War I and World War II was Germany, and uh, the, the, the association that all of us living, surviving Jews in the 21st uh, century have with uh, Germany is, is the Shoah. And, uh, and it's, it's so different to go back to the world of Moses Mendelssohn who really saw Germany as this, uh, you know, wonderful country, wonderful culture, and in, in many ways it was. It's not that he was uh, was mistaken, but he, he saw this as a, a, a as a country where Jews would have the opportunity to become citizens and to become emancipated, to become part of German uh, German culture, and he he dedicated his life to creating a form of Judaism that would uh, that, that could blend well with uh, with with German uh, with German culture and with uh, and with German politics and uh, the irony you, you don't judge somebody you don't judge an 18th century uh, character on the basis of what happened in the middle of the uh, of the twentieth century, but it but it is, it's a leap for us as we kind of study this period to 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 imagine the charm that Germany had in uh, in Mendelssohn's way of looking at the world. We'll talk about that a little bit towards the end of this session, uh, but I want to pick up where we left off last time, we were actually looking at a different issue related to, uh, to Mendelssohn and his Bible commentary. And if you'll pardon me for putting it this way, we were looking at, uh, at Mendelssohn's 
sincere Frumkite, his, his very conservative approach to Bible interpretation. Just to review, we saw this uh, text last time where uh, Mendelssohn describes in the introduction to his Torah commentary how he put this Torah commentary together and he approached Rabbi Solomon Dubno uh, who uh, writes, Dubno gathered together the Pshat explanations of scripture from the works of the earliest practitioners of Pshat exegesis. I mentioned last week that Mendelssohn thought that Dubno would be doing the entire project. He ended up only doing Breshit, and uh, Mendelssohn wrote the commentary on Shmot himself, and that's why most of the texts that we're going to be looking at today come from Sefer Schmott, because that's uh, Mendelssohn's own uh, writing, although he had involvement with every step of the uh, project. So he said that the major purpose of this commentary is to gather together the best of the traditional Pshat commentators, and the uh, Chain Haya, when you read the commentary, that's, that's essentially what happened. He gathered together the, he and his team gathered together the best explanations that they could find using their judgment from the, uh, uh, from the classical commentators. First of all, first of all from Rashi, who when he offers a pshat explanation, he has no equal, implying that Rashi doesn't always offer a pshat explanation as we all know. And then the crucial part of this text for me uh, from the works of his grandson, Rashbam, who delved into the pshat meaning of the text deeply, in fact, sometimes more than is appropriate. So much so that it happens that due to his great love of pshat, he occasionally misses the truth. A great phrase here, <speaking in Hebrew> that there's, uh, there's truth and there's pshat and they are not coterminous and you can be too interested in pshat and you end up neglecting the true meaning of the text. And we're going to see what he means by that. And then he says, and also from the works of Ibn Ezra, Shaya Baki Bechola Chochmori was ex an expert in all fields of study and all, uh, all the sciences. Mendelssohn expands in his introduction to Mishpatim. This is where we finished off last week with this text. M Mendelssohn's introduction to Mishpatim is where he explains why he thinks that Rashbam made a mistake, why he thinks that Rashi's grandson uh, did not offer the uh, correct kind of interpretation of the Bible. Uh, even though I mentioned last week, if you look through the uh, the number of comments that, that he quotes where he's following Rashi and the number where he's following Ibn Ezra and the number where he's following Rashbam, it seems like he follows Rashbam more often than the other two, but he doesn't like Rashbam and he's going to explain here what he doesn't like about Rashbam. <clears throat> uh, here's how Rashbam began his commentary on this uh, on, on this uh, parsha. Uh, Let those who love wisdom know and understand that my purpose, as I explained in Breshit, is not to offer halachic interpretations, wherein Hagadot and halachot are derived from superfluities in scriptural language, even though such interpretations are the most essential ones. That, that's the most important level of interpretation of the Torah, is Chazal's level of interpretation of the Torah, because we are halachic Jews and we follow the halacha, and the halacha is based on Midrash halacha, and Midrash halacha is a form of Midrash that's based on uh, extraneous words in the text. And some of these explanations, Rashbam writes, can be found in the works of my mother's, uh, my, uh, my mother's father, Rashi. Misatani Shlomo, Avi imi zecher tzadik livracha. But Ra Rashbam goes on to say, but my purpose is to explain the plain meaning of scripture. I will explain the laws and the rules of the Torah in a manner that conforms to the natural way of the world. Nevertheless, it is the halachic level of interpretation that's the most essential one. As the rabbi said, halacha uproots the plain meaning of the biblical text. That, you know, when you've got halacha on one side and you've got the plain meaning of the biblical text on the other side, halacha 
trumps the biblical the, the plain meaning of the biblical text and, the, and then the pshat uh, the pshat this disappears um, so, but although Rashbam professes this kind of, uh, of uh, loyalty to the pshat uh, I'm sorry this kind of loyalty to halacha we see that he offers many interpretations that can't uh, can't get along with halacha. We'll see examples of this very soon. Mendelssohn writes, we too will hover under the wings of the great eagle, Rashbam. We commented last week on how unusual it was that Rashbam was being called Hanesher Hagadol, the great eagle, and not depart from the plain meaning of scripture to the right or to the left. But we have not forgotten the principle which we laid down in the introduction to this work about the difference between contradictory explanations and differing explanations. So you can have, you can have a verse that has contradictory explanations and you can have a verse that has differing explanations. So what's it, what would be an example of differing explanations? So like, Lo tevashel gedi b'chalevi mo, do not boil a kid in its mother's milk. And so you could say that it means don't eat meat and milk. And you could say that it means don't take a baby goat and throw it into a pot. Those aren't contradictory. Those are different explanations of the verse, but they could both be true. It could be forbidden to eat meat and milk together. And at the same time, it could be, uh, uh, there could be an avera, a sin that's involved with throwing a, a goat into a pot uh, with, 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 its, uh, with, with its mother's milk because it's such a cruel thing uh, uh, to do. A text can be multivalent. It can have more than one meaning, but can a text have contradictory meanings? Can you have a text that says that you are uh, liable for doing something, you are chayav if you do it, and can, can you have a meaning that says you are patur, you are, uh, 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 you are innocent if you do it? Could those both be true at the same time? Could, could you both be liable if you do it? Could you be culpable if you do it and also be innocent if you do it? Mendelssohn says, no, that is not possible when you have contradictory explanations. So it is acceptable, Mendelssohn says, for the pshat to differ from the traditions of the rabbis, but it cannot contradict the rabbis in halacha or law. So if you have an explanation, if you come up with a pshat explanation and it leads you to an understanding that contradicts halacha, then you are, uh, you're in trouble. Uh, that can't be. Then what do you do in a situation like that? It's still possible for differing explanations to both be true, but contradictory explanations, if one of them is true, then the second is certainly false. That has to be the case. So whenever uncovering the pshat of scripture contradicts the traditions of the rabbis in halacha or law, the commentator must totally abandon the pshat and follow tradition, or if possible, explain how the two explanations can be reconciled. So you're looking at the text and you know what the halacha is, and it appears to you that the pshat contradicts that. So you work at it for a while and you see, can I actually, con can, I, uh, can I come up with a reconciliation so that they will both be true? And if you cannot come up with a reconciliation, then you have to abandon the pshat. Chova al hamevair laazov derech hapshat mikol vachol velalechet bederech hakabalah amitit. Follow the two true tradition. You can't offer an interpretation of the uh, uh, of the Torah that contradicts halacha. We have made this the guiding principle of our commentary, and we will keep to it with God's help. We will do this in this commentary, and we will not follow Rashbam on this, uh, on this point, because Rashbam in Parshat Mishpatim in particular, but in a lot of other places too, Rashbam on Parshat Mishpatim often explains a, a verse in a way that contradicts halacha. 
And we'll see a couple of examples of how Rashbam interprets a verse in Parshat Mishpatim and how Mendelssohn interprets a verse in Parshat Mishpatim. The beginning of Parshat Mishpatim, it talks about the Eved Ivri, the, uh, the Jewish uh, slave, the Hebrew slave, the Hebrew servant. Uh, and it says that he works for uh, six years and then he goes free uh, unless he decides to go through a ceremony that will make him a long-term servant, a long-term slave. And the, uh, the ceremony is described in the Torah. It says, Veratza Adonav et Osno Bamarzea Vaavado Le Olam. The owner of the slave uh, bores a, ho a hole in the ear of the slave with an awl, and then Vaavado Le Olam. Simple translation of the phrase Vaavado Le Olam, of course, is, and he is his slave forever. But Rashbam, the great Talmudic scholar that he was, knows that that's not the halakha. That the halakha is that the, uh, an Eved Ivri, a Jewish servant, a Jewish slave, can remain an Eved only until the Jubilee year. But Rashbam, writing in his commentary here, writes, Lafi hapshat kol yamei chayav kamo shenamar bishmuel v'yashav sham Ad olam, according to the plain meaning of scripture, lo olam means all the days of his life, as it says concerning Samuel, he must remain there for good. Ad olam. And I'm sure everybody understands here that this falls into the category of what Moses Mendelssohn called contradictory explanations. Either the slave goes free at the Yovel, at the Jubilee year, or he remains a slave all the days of his life. So if halacha says that the slave goes free uh, at, during the Jubilee year, then the interpretation being offered here by Rashbam is an anti-halachic explanation because it says, well, the pshat says that, uh, the pshat says that he shall remain a slave all the days of his life, just as it said about Shmuel when, uh, when, when he was brought by his mother to uh, live in, in, in the Mishkan, uh, in, in the shrine, uh, it says that he must remain there for good. And that doesn't mean that he would go free in the Jubilee year. It means he would spend the, uh, all of his life living there. It, it's a fascinating question how Rashbam understood interpretation to work. What does it mean to say, this is what God wants us to be doing, uh, this is the halacha, and this is what we are going to do. And just in case anybody has any doubts, Rashbam, no one should suspect for a moment that Rashbam was rebelling against halachic authority. And if you ask Rashbam, uh, halacha, according to halacha, how long does an Eved Ivri, who is an Eved Nirza, remain a slave? I'm certain that he would answer, halacha, the answer is he remains a slave until the Jubilee year, until the Yovel. But Rashbam says, but you wanna know what the verse says? The verse actually says that he will remain a slave all the days of his life. And, for some reason that Rashbam never explains to us, he's not troubled by this. He feels, uh, he feels that it's possible to offer an interpretation that uh, to, offer, to, to, to see two contradictory explanations as having some kind of relevance to us. He's bothering to tell us what he thinks the pshat is. So it, it, he thinks it has some kind of relevance to us, but he knows that the halacha is the opposite of that. Moses Mendelssohn in his commentary uh, bends over backwards to say that ba'avado le'olam on the pshat level actually means that he will work until the Jubilee year. He writes, we know that in biblical Hebrew, olam refers to time. And that th this is true, that although olam means world, in uh, post-biblical Hebrew, in the in biblical Hebrew, uh, the word olam is a reference to time. And lo olam here means up to the time of the Jubilee year because there is no 
longer period of time in the Jewish calendar. That's the longest period of time in the Jewish calendar. So for, for an olam, for a time, and it means the longest time period that there is and the longest time period that uh, the Jewish calendar gives us is until the Jubilee year. Furthermore, if you don't like that one, here's another explanation. When the slave goes free, it is as if his world has been renewed. This is in the kind of post-biblical sense of the word olam. His world has now been renewed. And he's quoting here from Ibn Ezra. And Ibn Ezra has the same problem that Moses Mendelssohn had. Even Ezra, who understands very well that the simple understanding of the word la'olam means forever, but he doesn't want to interpret it that way because he knows that that isn't what halacha says, and he doesn't want there to be this contradiction between halacha and pshat, and so he backs away here. Uh, he doesn't even mention the possibility of a meaning forever. He just comes up with reasons why we would we'd be able to say that the words of the verse support the halachic understanding. One other example from, uh, uh, from Parshat Mishpatim, the rule, what happens if a person digs a pit in uh, Rishut Rabim in public uh, property, and then an animal falls into this pit uh, what damages are to be paid. If the animal falls in there and dies, the verse says, Baal habor yishalem, the owner of the pit. The Talmud has a long discussion of that phrase, Baal habor, because he doesn't really own it because we're talking about a, a pit on public property, but the person who dug the pit on public property uh, becomes, uh, halachically speaking, he becomes the Baal Habor, even though he, he doesn't own it, but he's got responsibility for what happens with that boar. Kesef yashiv li valav, money or silver, if you will, he should give to the, to the owner of the animal. He, he has to pay, he killed the animal. Behamet ye lo. And the carcass is his. In theory, there are two possible antecedents for the word his, for the word low. Is low, does the word low refer to the person who owned the, this animal? Or did it refer to the person who... Uh, who dug the pit. And Rashbam explains, he writes, the, the, the smooth understanding of the text is the contextual understanding of the text. The way the words read best in the text is, Kevan Shemeshalem called Damav Bedin Hu Shahamet Ye Lamazik. Since the person who is responsible for the damages pays the entire price of the dead animal, the carcass now logically belongs to him. So if I dig the pit and Rabbi Kelman's uh, ox fell into the pit, then I have to give Rabbi Kelman the full value of the ox that died. And I get to keep the, uh, I get to keep the carcass because I have I paid for it because I gave him the full value of it. And so that's Rashwam says that that's the simplest understanding. And uh, I, I, I could in fact, I think give a, a, a uh, I think a pretty strong argument why that has to be the pshat interpretation of the verse. The, uh, the verse before it says, the person who is being talked about through those two verses is the is the person who dug the pit. We start with it with him. 
he iftach ish bor. You're talking about uh, you're talking about something that that person does. And then this verse also starts bal habor yishalem. The person who dug the pit. He's 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 the one who is being discussed. And then v'hamet yelo. The, the this uh, pronoun here lo his uh, logically is applied to the uh, to the noun that is the noun that has been discussed through this whole text. But Rashbam here writes. Sometimes he does this when he offers a uh, an interpretation that goes against the uh, Chazal. He says aval chachamin perushu lanizak. You know the pshat is that the carcass goes to the person who dug the pit. But the rabbis interpreted the verse to mean to the damaged party, to the owner of the ox. The owner of the ox gets the dead ox. And what the, what the Gemara essentially says is, uh, again, using the example, I dug the pit and Rabbi Kelman's uh, ox fell into the pit and the ox had been worth a thousand dollars. I don't know what an ox is worth these days. Uh, and the carcass is now worth $25, then I give Rabbi Kelman the carcass and I say, here's $25, Rabbi Kelman. And I now owe you $975 for the rest of the, uh, of the cost of the ox. And that's how, that's how Chazal interpreted the, uh, the, the text. And, and that Mendelssohn says when, he writes the commentary on this verse. He writes, and again, Mendelssohn himself wrote the commentary on the verses in, in, uh, in Shmot. He writes, the dead animal shall be his, shall belong to the damaged party. We estimate the value of the carcass and we deduct that amount from the payment due. Now, why does he say this? Because because he's a from Jew, <laughs> because he knows that that's what the Gemara says. And so he wants to interpret the text the way the Gemara interpreted it. The, uh, the great Talmudist Rashbam, one of the Balei Atosfot, feels it's fine to offer an interpretation that's, uh, that, that's not in consonant with, uh, with what uh, Chazal said. But Mendelssohn says, no, that's it. He said, this is the, uh, the, the deal that I made. We've made this the guiding principle of our commentary, that we won't offer an interpretation that goes against halacha, that contradicts halacha. And here are just a couple of examples of it, where he does this and where he outfroms Rashbam. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say about, uh, about Mendelssohn's from, very from attitude to Parshanut Hamikra. But now I'd like to take a look at a couple of texts. You know, Mendelssohn was a philosopher after all, and I'd like to take a look at a couple of texts where Mendelssohn gives uh, long, uh, long comments in his commentary on the book of Shmot, and, and it shows us a little bit about his philosophy and about his world view. Uh, there is, uh, I, I'd never, I have not managed to find anywhere on the web a, uh, an electronic copy, a, a copyable electronic copy of, uh, of Mendelssohn's uh, commentary. Any comments like this that, uh, that appear on this slide here, I just typed it out here. And with these really long texts, I'm sorry, I just couldn't sit and type them out in Hebrew. So I'm giving you the translation done by Eddie Breuer and David Sorkin in their uh, wonderful book of, uh, uh, that's a, uh, uh, a collection of uh, the best of Mendelssohn's Hebrew writings. Okay, so, oh, I'm sorry, I had one more example, I forgot. On the sale of Joseph, uh, Rashbam has this theory about the sale of Joseph that actually uh, Joseph wasn't sold by his brothers, he was sold by the Midianites and Mendelssohn writes here, well, this is actually Dubno because it's the commentary on Breshid. He says, although it is permitted for Pshat commentators to stray from the Midrashic explanations of the rabbis and to explain the plain meaning of scripture in another way, this is only when they could offer an explanation of the verses that better conforms with the language and the context. In the verses here, the opinion of the classical rabbis does a better job of solving the difficulties. I know that there are some Pshat guys out there who offer for a different, inter here, this isn't even halacha, this isn't a halachic issue, question of who sold uh, Joseph, but it says, you know, 
The old fashioned explanation of the rabbis is good enough. It explains the text well enough. We don't need these new fangled explanations like Rashbam's explanation about uh, the Midianites being the ones who stole them out of the pit. Okay, but now we go on to a, uh, a philosophical uh, issue on the uh, beginning of the Ten Commandments. Uh, Mendelssohn begins his commentary on this uh, on these verses by uh, discussing the question of does it make sense? A number of medieval Jewish philosophers discussed this question. Does it make sense for there to be a mitzvah to count as a mitzvah? believing in God. Uh, should we interpret the verse here, Anochi Hashem Elokecha, as a mitzvah that God told us that we should believe in God? Uh, I'm sure you all understand that there's a certain circularity in the argument. Uh, there can be a mitzvah only if I believe that God is the one who's speaking and I believe that God exists. And so what does it mean to say that God has told me that there's a mitzvah to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to believe in God. Uh, a number of medieval Jewish uh, philosophers discuss this. Mendelssohn uh, discusses this. And then after a rather lengthy discussion of this, he goes on to tell you how he understands what these verses are trying to uh, say. Is this readable? Should I make it bigger? It's readable. Um, I think it's readable. Okay, I just made it a little bigger and we'll see if that- And we can't see the width of the page when you make it bigger. Yes. There we go. Okay, yeah, th that's even better. Okay, very okay. good. It would appear that this is truly how it was. That the children of Israel, descendants of a long line of believers, maminim b'nei maminim, he writes in, uh, in, in, in Hebrew, knew and believed in the existence of God and his unity, some of them by means of intellectual discernment, and some of them as a received tradition from trustworthy ancestors or from leaders and sages of the generation. So, you know, all the Jews who were standing there at Har Sinai, they believed in God, some of them because they, they thought about it and they think that they, they realize that the most uh, sensible way of understanding this world of ours is that there is a God. They, they, they figured that out intellectually and some of them because they, you know, their, uh, their parents and grandparents taught them that there's a God and so that's why they believe there's a God. This statement in verse two, Anochi Hashem Elokecha Asher Otseiticha Me'eretz Mitzrayim, it wasn't to tell them to believe in God. This, this statement in verse two only intended to single them out as a special possession among all the nations. We're, we're, we're going to get to questions at the end. I see somebody raised her hand. I, I, we'll, we, we'll, we'll get to questions at, at the end. Uh, we're in slightly too big a group to take questions in the middle of the talk. Sorry. Uh, this statement in verse two only intended to single them out as a special possession among all the nations so that they become a holy people to God from among all the nations of the earth, as I will explain. This is because with regard to all the speculative intelligible propositions that we mentioned, the children of Israel are neither different from nor have any advantage over other peoples. Really, when it comes to the belief in God, that's not a Jewish belief. All people or all good people or all reasonable people or all intelligent people believe in God. And it's not a Jewish thing. All acknowledge his divinity may he be blessed. And even those who worship other gods acknowledge the great power and the unqualified might of the God most high, El Elyon. Everybody in the world understands, everybody who believes in a God, even if they're worshiping other gods, they know that there's a chief God. And this is a universal belief. And likewise, our sages said, they call him the God of gods. They refer to him as Elohei Elohim. Likewise, scripture states, I've never understood this verse, what Malachi is saying here in this verse, but Mendelssohn says, 
just the, take the shot. From where the sun rises to where it sets, this God speaking, my name is honored among the people and everywhere incense and pure oblation are offered to my name. Malachi is saying that all over the world, everybody is worshiping the God. And in the days of the prophet Malachi, you know, I find it hard to imagine that it was the case, but I, you know, I wasn't alive then, but anyway, this is, is true that Everybody is everybody actually who's thought about it believes in God and is worshiping God. And it would appear that this is what the psalmist was also referring to when he said, The heavens declare the glory of God. Hashamayim, the supreme quodel. You just look at the heavens and you understand that there's a God. No teaching, no words. I'm going to skip down a little bit. Uh, with these, there is neither speaker nor uh, words. Beautiful Perak Tehillim uh, describing how the, the heavens teach us about God. And then in the continuation it, it, uh, of that Perak of Tehillim, it says, only afterward did the psalmist point out the superiority of the Torah, which is a heritage of the congregation of Jacob. Notice when you go to shul on uh, Shabbat morning, uh, the, this uh, Shammai Supreme Quod El, which talks about uh, in the first one third of the psalm, it's talking about learning about God from nature. And then it says, Torah Tashem to Mima Meshivad Nafesh, it starts talking about a Torah. And that's, uh, it's a heritage of the congregation of Jacob, and it's exclusive to a special people. Through the Torah, they are distinguished from the other nations of the earth to set them high above all the nations. Although the peoples of the world acknowledge the existence of God and his power over everything, they nevertheless also worship a being other than him. So he's saying that all over the world, everybody realizes that there is a chief God, and that's the one that we believe in but they also worship a being other than him. Okay, so let's grant this for the sake of argument that Mendelssohn is right about this. What's he gonna say about the fact that those other nations are worshiping another being? Some of them worship ministering angels, thinking that God gave each of them a, a nation or a state or a province to rule and the ministering angels have the power to bring harm or benefit to them at will. They are referred to in the Torah and in all of scriptures as Elohim Acherim, other gods. As Ramban explained in his commentary on this uh, section on the Aserta Dibrot. And likewise, they were referred to as the gods of the peoples. For angels were referred to as gods. They are also called Elohim in the Tanakh. Others worship the celestial stars or demons or humans. They construct images and idols and they bow down to them as is known. And that, so what's, now we come to, I think this surprising part of his comment where he says what he thinks about what the Gentiles are doing. Now rational judgment would not compel one to prohibit worship of this kind to a descendant of Noah. Why should we say that a Gentile can only worship the God of gods? Why shouldn't we say that a Gentile can also worship the stars, the sun, the moon, the stars, other gods, human beings, as long as he does not think to remove himself from the domain of the God most high? For what would obligate him to direct all worship and prayer to the eternal alone? Bilti Lashem Levado, Zoveach Lelohim Yocharam, Bilti Lashem Levado, to the only to Hashem, only to God. Uh, are, are you, uh, so what, what logic is there in turning to a Gentile and saying to that Gentile, uh, you, you can only worship the God most high. If a person should hope for good and fear evil from a being other than him, other than God, and acknowledges that such a being is also subservient to the hand of the God most high, it would not defy reason were he to sacrifice, offer incense and libations and pray to that being, be it an angel or a spirit or a person, a mighty warrior, an officer, and a ruler. Who would tell us 
that all these forms of worship are properly directed to the eternal alone, were it not that the Holy One, blessed be he, warned us against it in his Torah. So uh, Mendelssohn is saying here that there's no logical reason that the non-Jews should be dedicating themselves only to the Lord uh, God of Israel, only to Elohei ha Elohim. And although he does not say this openly in this text, I'm sure that of course the non-Jews that he is thinking about most often are the Christians. And he thinks that the fact that the Christians have this thing called the Trinity and that they worship, uh, that they don't just worship God the Father, they also worship God the Son. And they also worship various saints and things like that. What's wrong with doing that from a logical perspective? What, what would be the problem in doing this? And indeed, the sages stated that the descendants, I put into this handout here, also into these texts here, I threw in Rambam. I don't know whether we're gonna have time to read uh, read through the Rambam, but it's so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you uh, about the Rambam in a second. And indeed the sages stated that the descendants of Noah were not warned against Shituf. So actually the sages were not the ones who said that the sons of Noah were not warned against Shituf. That's a, that, uh, it's not a Talmudic idea. It's first mentioned in the Tosfot. And then, uh, and then it is mentioned by Rabosa, Moshe Iserlis, the Rama, in his uh, in, in his glasses on the uh, on the Shulchan Aruch. But uh, Mendelssohn is claiming that the, for a non-Jew, to be a worshiper of God and of God's underlings is totally fine. Since with regard to Noah, uh, Noah hides, these deeds are not considered to be a rebellion against divine honor, as long as it is not their intention to remove themselves from the domain of the God of gods and the Lord of lords. Okay, I'm sure that many of you know Rambam's introduction to the laws of of Avodah Zarah. I put it on the uh, on the in the text here for those of you who don't know it. The uh, the Torah motion will uh, will post these texts uh, uh, after uh, after the class. So Rambam says that that was the whole problem with idolatry that people made this mistake. They said that if God is uh, is so great and God gave some of his glory to the sun and the moon and the stars and to various people in the same way that, you know, if you have a king who you wish to give honor to, or you feel that you ought to be giving honor to, and the king has given, has appointed somebody to be his secretary of state or, or, or something like this, you also honor the secretary of state. That's, you don't say the only the only one that I'm going to honor is the king. You also honor the underlings. And so Rambam says, this was the mistake that people made uh, because after a while, they totally forgot about God. And that's the problem with idolatry. And, uh, and, and Mendelssohn is saying, actually, there's nothing wrong with this. It's just fine, except for Jews, it doesn't work that way. However, he says, we are the people close to him since he brought us out of Egypt, the house of bondage and did all these wonders for us in order to be his very own treasured people from among all the peoples. And on account of his ruling over us in his glory directly without the means of an angel or celestial minister or star, we, his servants are obligated to accept upon ourselves the yoke of his kingship and rule and to fulfill his decrees. It's just, it's just different for Jews because, and, and that's the meaning of the beginning of Aseret uh, Hadibrot of the Ten Commandments. I'm God who took you out of Egypt. And because of that, I'm asking you to do something that I don't ask anybody else to do, which is to limit your worship just to me. I did something special to you, so I'd like you to do something special back with Mendelssohn saying, but 
what the other people do. There's nothing wrong with what the other people do because they didn't have that special relationship with God. So they, they don't have to be, uh, it's, have an exclusive relationship with God. Uh, he decreed upon us not to worship anything other than him. And he specified the forms of worship that are appropriate to him alone, but not to any other, uh, any being other than him. And it is thus not appropriate to conjoin another God to him with any of these modes of worship. Thus scripture said, or when you look up to the sky, and you see the sun, the moon, the stars, the whole host of heavens, and you are misled to venerate them and worship them, since indeed the eternal, your God, has surely permitted them. You know, he's actually he's quoting the Hebrew. And what the Hebrew says here, Asher chalak Hashem lechol ha'amim tachat ha'shamayim. Uh, and he interprets that to mean that God permitted everyone in the world except for Jews to worship the celestial bodies. And, and it makes sense on a certain level to worship the celestial bodies because God gave them great honor. And we want to give honor to God and we want to give uh, honor to God's, uh, to God's underlings and, and, and uh but the eternal took you from the iron furnace. That is, he led you out of Mitzrayim so that you might become as treasured people as you now truly are. That only for, uh, for Jews is there this, uh, th this requirement of exclusivity. And it, okay, we'll, we'll read a little more and then we'll talk about what the, uh, the significance of this is. As such, our verse may be restated as follows. I, the speaker and commander, and the eternal, who was, is, and will be the source of all existent things, who is provident and present at the time of their troubles to those who love me, your God, mighty and powerful, from whom all good is hope, hoped and all bad is feared. and to whom it is fitting to direct all prayer and worship who led you out of the land of Mitzrayim, out of the house of slaves, that you might become his treasured people. There's a, there's, there's a, it's a matter of relationship, but it's not a matter of ideology. There's nothing, there's nothing better about the ideology of saying I am only going to worship God and I'm not going to worship an idol. That's, it, it's, it's because of the history that we have with God, that that's why, uh, why we are that way. And this, okay, we'll read a little more and say a little more about, uh, about it. Uh, that was the question that the scholar Judah Halevi may, he, uh, may his resting place. Oh, I'm sorry. You will understand from this why he did not say, I am the eternal, your God, who created the heaven and the earth and who created you. This was the question that the scholar Judah Halevi, may his resting place be an honor, asked Ibn Ezra, and which is also raised in his Kusari, but his answer is inadequate, both in the Kusari and in Ibn Ezra's uh, commentary. Even Ezra says that, that uh, Yehuda Levi had asked him this question, why do the Ten Commandments not begin with, I am God who created the, heaven and, uh, the heavens and the earth? Why does it begin, I am God who took you out of Egypt? And he says, well, they, the answers offered by Yehuda Levi and the Kuzari and by Ibn Ezra and his uh, Bible commentary are a little different uh, from each other, but uh, Mendelssohn's is totally different from them. He says that that's not what's being said here. That the reason for exclusivity in worship is not because God created the world. Whether a belief in creation and production of the world in time could be sustained by decisive rational demonstration, as some scholars think, or whether reason cannot determine between this view and the belief in the eternity of the world as per Maimonides and the guide, this belief in any weight is not unique to God's treasured people alone and is not a reason for the acceptance of the exclusive yoke of his sovereignty and a rejection of Shitu. Okay, let's say for the sake of argument that we, you can prove philosophically that God created the world. But if he, if you prove that, that that doesn't in any way apply, imply that you ought to be worshiping God alone. 
But being taken from the house of slaves, from slavery to freedom, is the correct reason for this. It is like what it, it likewise applies to the observance of the other commandments of the Torah, such as that of the Sabbath. And although this precept serves as a sign for the creation of the world, the descendants of Noah are not commanded to desist from all work on this day. And because it's all just, it's all just because of the relationship with God. It's all just because of the history of the special relationship with God. But what essentially Mendelssohn is doing here is he's presenting a version of Judaism that says, you know, we observe the mitzvot and we, we, we restrict our prayer only to uh, Elohei Elohim, to the God of gods, but we have nothing against people who don't observe the mitzvot. And we have nothing against people who, uh, who worship idols, so to speak, in the Jewish understanding. And so what... <laughs> It, it, it's it, it's clear to me that what's uh, shining through in this text is Mendelssohn's uh, liberal values and open feelings about the religion of the people among whom he lives, who he knows do not restrict their worship to God the Father and who he knows do not observe the mitzvot of the Torah the way Jews observe them. And he says, and that's, that's totally fine. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just, they don't have this kind of relationship. So is there like, in Mendelssohn, like a criticism that can be leveled of Mendelssohn's approach is that, is there like any intellectual content to Judaism, is there something that the Torah teaches me, some ideas that the Torah teaches me that are, you know, that make my life better because I study the Torah and because I observe the Torah and make me understand the world better? That's not the way he describes it here. It's, you know, what, what other people is do, are, are doing is also totally fine. And I'll just want to see quickly one other text where this comes across in his commentary on, uh, on Shmot, on the verse that I mentioned before, Lo Tavashel Gedi Bachalei Bimo. He writes, now one should not ponder why the Holy One prohibited meat and milk. For God decreed many commandments for us without revealing their rationale. However, it should suffice for us to know that they are commanded from him. May he be blessed. And inasmuch as we have accepted upon himself the yoke of his kingship, we are obligated to do his will. The benefit of such commandments lies in their performance not in knowing their reason. Don't spend time trying to figure out what the reason for Basar Bachalov is, for refraining from eating meat and milk. I say this not, heaven forbid, as one who denigrates the honor of the great Torah scholars who endeavored in such speculation and sought to understand the reasons of the commandments whose meanings were not revealed. You all know that whenever somebody says, I'm not, God forbid, denigrating the honor of the, well, they're, they're, they are hinting that they are denigrating the honor of the, uh, all these people, as you'll see in the continuation. For we know that their intention was only for the sake of heaven. You know, I, I know that they had good intention when they tried to explain the Tam Meha Mitzvot. However, it is patently clear that for all the breadth of their understanding, they offered only weak reasoning with no basis. They were unconvincing. And in the end, it was possible for the evil inclination to refute their words and for the Gentiles to use them to taunt Israel, as the sages said, with regard to the commandments whose reasons were not revealed. They didn't help at all by offering ta'ameha mitzvot. 
In fact, the ta'amim that they offered, the explanations that they offered were so weak that it led to uh, the taunting of Israel and the mocking of the Torah. To us, the true believers in God and his Torah, the sages put it well. Can one perhaps say there were empty commandments? Scripture states, uh, I am the eternal. I decreed them and you have no right to question them. Okay, you don't understand them, but you do them. And so, so for Mendelssohn, the great philosopher who's really interested in philosophical issues, but he doesn't feel that his philosophy is coming to him from the Torah. The Torah is describing you know, a, a special relationship that God had with the Jewish people, a relationship where God intervened in history on behalf of the Jewish people, and then asked the Jewish people to do various things that have nothing to do with my intellectual philosophical attempt to understand the world. This text is, in many senses, it's still a very from text where he's saying, you know, we have to observe these mitzvot, but the mitzvot have been, you know, like reduced to a little corner now. Uh, and and, and it, it is not that we now, because of studying Torah and observing mitzvot, have a better understanding of the world. That's not what is happening. We're just, there's, because of history, because of the relationship that we had in the past with God and that God had with us, that is why we, uh, so that, that, that's Mendelssohn's understanding of mitzvot and Mendelssohn's understanding of, um, uh, of the reason why Jews have to observe mitzvot, not in order for them to advance themselves intellectually, uh, philosophically, to understand the world better or something like that. It's just it's part of the relationship and the history. Okay, I'll stop here. And if there are questions in the chat or the somebody wanted to uh, ask a question before, was it Esther who wanted to ask a question before? Do, do you wanna ask it orally? Uh, you're muted, Esther. You have to unmute yourself. All right, if not. No, no, I'm fine. Okay. Oh, okay. Fine. The, the fact that the, the Ten Commandments is talking about Yitzhak Mitzrayim, personally, that we were being told that that's the reason why we, we really have to follow it. Right. So just gonna that's say precisely that. what Mendelssohn's <laughs> arguing there. That's right. That it's because of Yitzhak Mitzrayim. For some reason, God intervened on our behalf. Because he intervened on our behalf, there's various things that we have to do because of that, but, but not because this raises us to a higher level or something of that nature. Uh, Can I ask you an unfair question? Maybe because- sure. go if, ahead. If somebody else, you go first. I only go at, here at the end. If anybody else would like to ask, but um, you wanna talk, it's not exactly your topic, but historically for two minutes, unfairly, why was Mendelssohn so viciously attacked as the founder of Reform then? You read what he writes, he's a really from guy. Like, and we know he was, and I know you spoke last week a little bit, the kids intermarried and Eddie Breuer told me years ago, you know, be very young and we, you can't judge people, but there, there has to be some, there's something going on that I don't quite get. Like if you yeah, actually I, read what he wrote. I, uh, well, I would argue, you know, uh, others might uh, see it differently, but I think that the very idea that Jews should become part of the uh, general society was a, an amazing chiddush. You know, for us now, for anybody who's at a Torah in motion event, it's clear that it's just fine for Jews to be part of the general, uh, the general society and, to, and for the, the Canadians who are here today to say, I am a Canadian and to say it proudly. And, and, and the Americans to say, I am an American and to say it proudly. Rashi never said, I am a Frenchman. I'm, I'm sure of, of that. He never saw himself as being part of the society. Uh, and, and, and there were 
people who we would call Haredi, uh, who we would call today Haredim, who understood very well that that's what Mendelssohn was advocating, that Jews become part of the society and the countries in which they lived. And, and, and these opponents of Mendelssohn felt that they wished to be a kind of nation within the nation they don't want to be part, become part of the German or the Prussian or the French nation. They want the Germans or the Prussians or the French to leave them alone to run their own affairs, and we won't uh, we won't mix in. Uh, a friend of mine in Toronto once told me that her uh, her father, who was a uh, who was a Holocaust survivor, when he went for his uh, for his uh, uh, citizenship test to become a Canadian citizen, they asked him, uh, uh, Mr. So-and-so, what is the system of government in Canada? And he answered, I don't mix in. I, I go to the supermarket and I come home and I don't. He thought that the, that the, you know that he he still had the impression that the right thing for a Jew to do was not to mix in, not to have anything to do with the with the system of government in in, in the country. And, and I think that that was a very common Jewish approach. And yesh mashu lomar lishut So there's something to say about that, but that. Mendelssohn is the one who, who, who came up with the idea that it is possible to live a, a, a Jewish life and of Shmirat Mitzvot while being part of the German or the Prussian uh, people. And that, that's your, you get many of your values from being part of the German and the Prussian people, but you'll, you'll continue to observe mitzvot and you'll study Torah and you'll care about Hebrew grammar. And But but w w when you're looking for what, what is going to influence the, like my worldview, where does my worldview come from? I don't think that Mendelssohn was among those who was saying, my worldview comes from Torah. Uh, so I, I think, that's why they, they, they attacked him so fiercely. But I think the Sofo Davar in the bottom line analysis, he won, uh, at, at least in the Torah in motion circles, he won because we, we do wanna be involved in the, uh, in the countries in which we live. And we do wanna see ourselves as citizens of the countries in which we live. Okay, I mean, there's more to say obviously, but thank yes. you. Uh, okay, any other question be before we end it? Uh, it's, um, otherwise, I will invite everybody. Um, of course, 2.15 this afternoon, in just a couple hours, we're starting our plan to be a 13-part series with Lori Novak and Ilona Sober on men, women, and ritual. That's something that Dr. Lakshin, I think, has spent a lot of time involved in, and it's an important you know, you know, subject. We'll be looking at the text involved. Lori's a wonderful teacher. If you haven't heard her, she's taught a couple times for us. She lives uh, in Afrat, the Yowetzet Halakha, and um, runs the Derecheha, the, the organization she, she founded. So that's, and those who live in Toronto remember Ilana Sober from the years back, and uh, we look forward, to, they'll be taking turns, or Lori's gonna be most of it. Yeah. And, uh, and this evening, of course, at eight o'clock, our Dr. Moshe Sokolov on Haftarot, um, profiting from the prophets, as uh, we put it. If you like that title, or you think it's too corny, you can let me know. But uh, how to profit from the prophets. And, uh, and then tomorrow, Shuli Mishkin at 11 a.m., the last of her series on archaeology. And then at 8.30 p.m., Rabbi Benjamin Samuels from the Boston area, um, will be, I think he's yeah, in Sharon, um, will be giving our, our Parsha HaShavua Shir. And uh, Dr. Lakshin, next week, we'll be starting on Rav David Svi Hoffman, who, yes. um, uh, another German, uh, great rabbinic, uh, a great, you know, really the, the Gadol Hador of Germany at the turn of the 20th century. I think everybody would acknowledge that. And uh, from his halachic work and his uh, and the first one to take on Wellhausen, I think you know, point blank, the the first rabbinic serious response to Wellhausen dealing with the issue. So that's what we'll pick up on next week.
Um, okay, looking forward to seeing you many times before next week. And everybody <laughs> be well and uh, um, let your friends know, you know, you know, spread the word, be healthy, be well, enjoy the weather while you can. I think it's going to be turning cold soon, but the weather in Toronto is absolutely glorious for this time of year. Wow, this is a, a special treat that we can all ignore, ignore, we can all enjoy. Uh, we'll, we'll soon have to ignore it because uh, won't be coming back for four or five months. But anyways, okay. <laughs> All right, Wonderful. thank you, everybody. Wonderful seeing you all. Okay, and good luck on your...